her farm in their wood lot and but there were a lot of dark cars and then suits that were seen in the small town that week. But those that's the the exact same thing of burning the looms. There used to be thousands of those in every county where farmers could reuse their own seeds. Yeah. I don't yeah. like to think of like the tragedy that would happen if the monocrop was destroyed by it and there was a famine. However, the optimist in me says that's when um, innovation happens and things start over and try and you Absolutely. try again. You you know yeah. and you learn from the first time. Yeah. Um, and so almost sometimes when start things start getting as bad as we're kind of talking about, yeah, it's the inevitable. Like it, things are gonna crash before you know things get dark before they get light. Um, and so you'd have the the revolutions and such. So I think there's a revolution on the horizon. I just don't like to think of the negative that's it, gonna happen before it. It's tragedy and conflict breeds innovation. Yeah, it's true. Um, one quick question, because me being the, the least socioeconomic person here. So were the Luddites the people who owned the factories no. or the workers? Because they were the workers. workers. No, no, oh, not, was, even, not even. Not even. Yeah, it was all the other factories. There were, yeah. Yeah, there were artisans and craftsmen who felt that their livelihood was being taken. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. For, okay, okay. Because for a second I thought you were saying the factory owners broke the looms. I was like, yeah. I'm not and, quite and, following that. And they were, they were actually popular enough to where uh, Lord Byron wrote a poem, you know, an epic poem, like, in favor of the Luddites that was published, like, the world over, uh, you know, but today, because uh, we live in a society written by the victors, you know, we view the Luddites as, you know, being fools who couldn't catch up with the times, you know. Yeah. But increasingly, I think there's an acknowledgement that that situation may happen to a much larger population in the next couple of decades than, uh, than we believe. So, you know, uh, as, um, as artificial intelligence advances, it means that a lot of professions where we thought that you know just being well educated was enough to have a job, a lot of those things are going to go away. And uh, you know there's increasingly discussion about you know what's the what's the right economic setup in a world in which you know most people's jobs will disappear. I, I mean, there's apparently evidence there are already artificial intelligences that are creating online uh, cell phone accounts sure. because because <laughs> we have more than we have people. So. <laughs> I, I like I like this metric. <laughs> like, are there a lot of cell phone accounts? We're advancing technology. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, continue. Well, I mean, that, that's about access. But yeah, I mean, so. One thing I'm hearing here that that is that we haven't really kind of sorted out. We kind of let there be kind of a, a permeable boundary between um, the the socioeconomic impacts of technology within America and within the developed world, and then the socioeconomic impact of technology in in the you know rest of the world and everything. And it occurs to me that when you talk about what is the socioeconomic impact in, in the United States, you're talking about a very different thing right. than what is the socioeconomic impact of science and technology right. in, in Africa. And we've kind of, I think we've, we've been in a lot of this discussion kind of moved back and forth across those borders, but um, maybe we need to spend a little time, you know, talking about the, the ways they manifest differently. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to raise a point, because I wanted to disagree with you real strongly about this, was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the life expectancy in Africa and Asia was going up. Yeah. Because at that time, we had more vaccines and more clean water. And what happened? Well, the AIDS crisis happened, and that helped in parts of Africa to really reduce life expectancy. So we never necessarily know what. And so in other words, a lot of technology, and in that case, I would say medicine and public health things, have improved on life expectancy overall. I would also point out, when you look at the fact that birth control, clean water, and more women surviving childbirth happened just before women fought for the right to vote, for yeah. example, sometimes you need to have the time to fight for obvious rights. And I think that that's Absolutely. one yeah, of the so, issues. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you were here for this, but at the beginning of the panel, okay. he asked, you know, what positive things have happened outside of science. And I very clearly mentioned that you know, that scientific advancements have been one of the significant contributors to the you know, total reduction, I mean, improvements in global health, yeah. right? total reduction of um, uh, child mortality under five and so on. So I completely acknowledge that. But I would, what, I, what I want to add as a caveat to that is that it is not ever just the science by itself. It always right. comes with the building of stronger institutions, you know, changes in attitudes and beliefs about who is, should have access to the science and so forth. And that there's a tendency to believe, you know, to highlight the science because it's so visible, right? I mean, everyone can see the vaccines, but it's really hard to imagine all the, you know, healthcare systems that have to be managed and the institutions that they're kind of boring. It's like, you know, nobody wants to see a manager talking to their, 
you know, community healthcare record about, okay, go make sure you go vaccinate this village. Whereas you can, you know, you can take pictures of, you know, a child taking an oral, oral polio vaccine. Um, and so there's this tendency we have to explain things that require both science and social change to cause a positive social result as being due to the science, even though, in fact, you know, both are at least as important. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, I think, I think definitely if you, have, if you have the science without kind of, and I'll, I'll label them humanitarian values, you know, um, you, you, I mean, then, right. you, then you get like Nazi exactly. Germany, and so you yeah. know, I mean, it's it's you know, you can definitely yeah. need you need a value structure that that leads to human improvement. Um, and the, the, so. uh, speaking of Africa, as you have brought up that that question, um, in Africa in the sixties and seventies, also when we were getting this sort of, I mean, there was this sort of like. I like to label it like the teary-eyed moment in the West where we're just like, our successes in Africa are finally coming true. But a lot of those things that happened were the result of conflict, revolution, and socioeconomic theory and implementation. There was a lot of experimentation when it came to seeing what works for Africa. And it's an emphasis of what works for Africa because previously Africa had been divided by the world's imperialistic powers. Um, uh, I'm reminded of Thomas Sankara uh, who in uh, what's name? Burkina Faso? Uh, he uh, he seized power um, in a coup, uh, you know, which is sadly common in a lot of the uh, what we label as the third world. Um, uh, but Thomas Sankara, after seizing his coup, brought up the important point of you know uh, the hand that feeds you can kill you, and uh, did something which the West thought impossible. Uh, he developed. Uh, Food independence, complete uh, food in, like and agricultural independence from uh, Western importation of goods, because something that is completely unnecessary that is forced on a lot of communities and countries is the importation of goods that they don't really need. Uh, a lot of Africa is, you know, basically like a gigantic breadbasket. Like it, you know, they're able to basically grow a lot of the things that they want and need. Uh, and he proved that, uh, and uh, actually was sanctioned by like the World Bank and other forces for developing food independence. And a lot of the theories like in Kenya, Burkina Faso, uh, Egypt, uh, South Africa, and so forth, uh, a lot of these uh, social advancements were tied to the fact of, well, can we develop science and technology that works for us Africans here, independently of whatever the Western powers have decided to give us. So it was an, it was an age of innovation that was crushed by those imperialistic powers. <laughs> I mean, in, in Burkina Faso, you see uh, the French uh, funded, I mean, in a very Shakespearean sort of way, uh, they funded a coup d'etat against Thomas Sankara by his childhood friend. And, uh, you know, it, which actually completely reversed everything that happened. Importation of unnecessary corn and wheat and other goods into the country happened again. And the uh, life expectancy dropped, the uh, quality of life dropped drastically. And, you know, this continues today with, because a lot of, sadly, also, I mean, I use Tom St. as like a, a good historical viewpoint, but um, you still have places like Zimbabwe, which were promised social change, and now suffer a lot worse than some of their neighbors, you know. You had, you had mentioned a little while earlier, you know, the idea of the next big kind of, kind of science revolution coming out of Africa, and, and that reminded me, uh, there's an astrophysicist, Neil Turok, who's, who's uh, in Canada, he's, he's a South African though, and his, um, he was awarded the TED Prize, and, and what he spent that on was starting like, like math and science academies throughout Africa with the idea that, that it really needs to be cultivated in, in access to science and math and technology, you know, with the, his, the kind of his speech was on the next Einstein needs to come out of Africa, you know, to kind of really lead like an educational revolution there, so, so that they can solve their own problems rather than having everyone come in and kind of tell them, here's what you need to do. And, yes. So, I, I remember uh, a chemical and reality seminar when I was in college, and my, my major professor loved the example of, you know, you talk about idiots making changes. So the Westerners, um, back when missionaries went to Polynesia, um, were trying to help and make changes. Um, the unexpected genetic change they made to the Polynesians was they 
my, my professor liked to say they came to do good and did right well. They had sex with the females in the population, and because in that population they tended to have only male children because of the sex link characteristic, they made a change in the population. They no longer only had male children. They no longer had the impetus to be the great traders of Polynesia, and it completely ruined their society. So we make changes that we don't expect because we think we understand, we think we're smart, we think we can help, you know, we're gonna give them Christianity at that time. <laughs> but, but what we do is we have an unexpected down the road impact because we're not as smart as we think about. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's within science, technology, or even how we approach our humanitarian values, there's sadly a paternal aspect to it. Uh, you know, it's just kind of like, we, we know a bit better than you do, please let us, you know, close you, feed you, help you, uh, and you know, a lot of the time history has proven that we do a lot more damage than good, and a lot of the good ends up benefiting us, the people who provide the humanitarian aid or values to societies that we think absolutely need it, when in fact, you know, it goes back to the whole like teach a man to fish sort of idea, you know, if we talk people to, you know, Oh, here, this is how you uh, develop your own cricket farm to sustain yourself with your protein, et cetera, like that. That's, that's completely different than being like, here's your package of uh, food for today. Uh, please do not eat it all and split it equitably. Bye. You know, it's, <laughs> that's completely different, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, did you have something? Um, I, you looked at one I one. did. Um, then, then I'll get it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that's what I was just in the... In this idea, um, a lot of businesses are actually employing anthropologists because they're seeing the economic benefit of it, of if you take somebody trained to go into a culture and understand the culture and their values for what they are and not the um, ethnocentric, our view of them, you know, as Westerners. Um, so now businesses are taking advantage of that and hiring anthropologists because you can make more money if you actually understand their values. But that's where anthropologists are important in the aid efforts. And, and, and like what I'm trying to do is because you can, the, the goal is to not destroy their culture and to actually help them. Do, um, no, I had to ask this one. So do you, when, and not you specifically, but just kind of the people who, who do that work, do you find that they frequently like are at odds with the corporate interests or do the corporations generally <coughs> want like a win-win like do, do um, you think that's a very sincere it's thing? um it's hard because it, it's definitely like a selling out job to be the anthropologist that works for the business <laughs> that works for the oil company <laughs> yes yeah. absolutely um but i think there is a little bit of valor to trying to go in and just make things better and you know so there's probably some headbutting but if you can make things slightly better mm -hmm. you had your little personal victory oh well, i'm just curious yeah i mean you, sir, in the back. All right. Hey. Um, so, I don't know about solving the world's problems, but you're all smart people. And uh, we all have lives and families and community. What do you think we could do in our own lives, our own community, to enhance the socioeconomic impact of science for the benefit of ourselves and our families? Start with. Well, so I go back to uh, what I call the law of amplification, which is that technology amplifies underlying human forces. And what that basically says is that, um, you know, technology is like the engine in a car, right? We can keep making it go faster, but ultimately it's up to the driver to decide where the destination is and then get us there safely. Uh, and, you know, in this analogy, we're the driver. So it kind of, you know, I think there's a tendency to worry about what's under the hood when, you know, we can do a lot more to pick the right destination and uh, make sure we wear our seatbelts and and so on and so forth. Um, so I kind of think of you know, the best way to make sure that science ends up uh, helping us is to make sure that we end up doing the right things you know, with or without science. Um, and if you can get those things done both at an individual level as well as at a, you know, at a policy level uh, through activism, um, those changes make the most difference. Yes. Um. Ethics <laughs> are very important um, to push the people around you, and especially those people who uh, perceive themselves as being right and having power over you, into being more ethical in the way that they choose to, you know, spend our money and uh, choose to develop our societies and everything like that. Um, we have that ability, thankfully, in 
I mean, somewhat, uh, it decreases more as time goes on. Um, we have the ability within our Western societies to push these people in power continuously, whether it's through shame, the ballot box, the ever-powerful dollar, what have you, to uh, apply ethical solutions to, uh, you know, everyday or even larger problems. Um, now, even I would say that's a bit optimistic, <laughs> given that advice, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things we have, but it's also, um, you, uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's the idea in, uh, in political science, the theory of, like, you can't actually be neutral on a moving train. Uh, you know, if, if you're just like, well, I hope science advances, but, you know, uh, uh, you know I, I don't really care about the candidate uh, who does it, or, you know, I don't really care which, you know, corporation is funding the advancement. You know, you've chosen a side to things, which is, you know, in my opinion, the bad side. Uh, the more informed you are, the more you encourage other people to be informed. This leads to uh, a revolution of sorts, of people wanting to have more control over how uh, their technology and their science develop, and their science develops. Also, I, I like to joke that the idea of like a modern day institution of like, not, not like anyone forcing you to do it, but a modern day like personal institution of tithing to uh, but instead of to the church, but to, uh, you know, research institutions and what have you, uh, goes a long way, uh, surprisingly. And it, it doesn't just have to be the Bill Gates of the world that, you know, throw their billions behind uh, science. I mean, uh, I, I hate to sound like some sort of infomercial, but even a dollar a day to your appropriate cause could make a big difference. Okay. I'll, I'll give one quick reply because I want Julie to finish up. Um, you know, the, the con is, is doing a, sort of a donation drive for Heifer International, which is a, a charity I support for years. Because my wife was religious and she tithed, and we stopped being religious. She still wanted to tithe. I said, okay, we just aren't going to do it at the church anymore. And, um, and Heifer is one of the, the organizations, and completely on this is this idea of, you know, self sufficiency, you know, everything. Because that's the organization where they, like, you know, buy people, like, like chickens and goats and you know, everything. And but they also them. teach them. And, and yeah. they teach them, yeah, it's not just here you go, have fun. It's, it's like, no, you have to actually uh, know, know what you're doing. But um, so I, I, you know, I, I literally practice and, and, have, and write about, um, you know, the idea of kind of a, a non-religious tithing. A scientific so, tithing. A scientific, not even necessarily science, because I, I would say it's more ethics and more values. Yeah. And, and sometimes I donate to science things that I think are, are good too. But I think the promotion of values, because as, as both of these said, it's, it's the values that you can more easily, um, that can get overlooked. Because, I mean, we want the cool new gadgets. We want the cool new discovery. But it's easy to get kind of swept up in that and forget that, like, oh, th these in technologies impact people, and people should think about that while it's going on. And I'll let Julie finish up. Uh, so in thinking of ways that science can go forward and make differences, the, the more variable your, your scientists, the more variable your possible science. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and so I would say the best thing you can do is check your privilege and recognize that we've had access to education and access to going into scientific careers. Um, and, and by doing that and realizing that sort of privilege, you start realizing that ed the education of underprivileged classes largely African-American and, 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 the, and the other representation of women in science. And so if we can get science outreach to these different groups, then we create more diverse scientists who start creating more um, resolutions. Okay, thank you thank all. You. This was great. Thank you. Thank you.